haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Matt Darby. I get to be the teaching pastor here on our Gilmer campus, and I love what I get to do, and um, I'm so thankful that you're here today. And if you're a guest with us, or maybe you've been fairly new over the last uh, few weeks or months, uh, I, I want to tell you we are in the middle of something called our Legacy Initiative. This is uh, a thing God has called us to do as our church has grown and continues to grow, where we're going to be stepping out uh, uh, to build a worship center and some additional life group space. And uh, I know for many of you, you, you may be fairly new going, I have no idea what that is. Great. Some of you have been around a while, and last fall we did a couple of opportunities for you to come, and you may have just missed those. So here's what's going to happen. This Sunday, this coming Sunday, not today, a week from today, February the 4th at 5 o'clock in this room, um, I want to invite you to come to a legacy event. And what we're going to do is we're going to gather. I'm going to walk you through what God's leading us toward. You'll get to see some of the dreams that we're dreaming for what it'll look like. Uh, get to ask questions and all of those things uh, that are so important for us. And so if you're going, man, I want to know what this is about. I've heard about it, um, but, I, but I feel like I need to know more. And, I, and I, maybe I've got some questions. That Sunday at 5 o'clock, I'm inviting you, encouraging you uh, to come and be in the room, and uh, let's discover what God's calling us to do uh, together. All right, grab your Bibles, head to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. We're stepping back into the book of Ephesians. Uh, last year, if you were here, you know we spent a good portion of the year in the book of Ephesians uh, looking at... Uh, really, we broke the first part of Ephesians down into two series. One was called, In Him We Are. In Christ, who are we? We were answering that question, what is our identity in Jesus? The next series was called, In Him We Do. And how, how who we are in Jesus shapes how we live for Jesus. And one of the things that we discovered was the absolute necessity of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in us if we are going to live lives for Jesus. If the life of Christ is going to be lived through us, then we need the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to continue in that today in Ephesians 5. We're starting a series today called Spirit-Filled Family. Spirit-Filled Family. Um, now, I want to tell you this is for everybody. It's for everybody. Married, single, kids, no kids, right? It's for all of us. This is for everyone. Because what we're going to discover is what it means to have homes that are filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that look like in my marriage? What does it look like raising my kids? What does it look like at my job between my employees or my, to, toward my employer? And the goal of this series over these next few weeks is not to hold up a standard that none of us are hitting and go do better. Right? You ever feel like that? I hope I don't preach like that, but maybe I do. If I do, I'm sorry, right? Where you go, man, I'm going to church, and all he does is talk about what I'm not doing, feel terrible, sorry, right? The goal is not that. The goal is the, that we would see the necessity of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our life, especially home and family. We would see it there. And as I thought about my own home, and I thought about my own kids and my own marriage, um, I, I began to ask myself, what are the dreams I'm dreaming for my family? And I wanted to ask you that question. I'm going to put it up because I want you to sit with it for a minute. What dreams are you dreaming for your family right now? Just think about that. Think about your marriage. Think about your children or your grandchildren. Think about their future, your job. What dreams are you dreaming for your family? Now, I don't want you to think of the. I don't want you to start thinking of things off the hip, right? That are the Sunday school answer that you'd know to make the preacher happy. No, I want you to be honest. What are the things you truly desire? What do you want to see accomplished in the lives of your children? Because here's the question I felt the Holy Spirit hit me with this week: Are the dreams that I'm dreaming for my family all within reach with hard work, thoughtful planning, being organized, being confident? being a positive person, being a good person, and just working really hard. Are all those dreams within reach with those things? And then I had to ask the question, what are the things I'm dreaming for my family that are absolutely impossible apart from the presence of God and the power of the Holy Spirit? 
So now ask yourself that question. What dreams do you dream for yourself, your marriage, your children? What dreams are you dreaming that are utterly impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit at work? Because here's what I know. And I know this is true for all of us. We want more for our children than financial security, right? I do. I want more than that. Sometimes we kind of get hung up in that. We get hung up in that. I just hope they don't have to worry about money and that they do better than, than I did and I put them in a better place and they get the right job and they find the right person. And I want that to happen. But more than that, I want them to know God and I want them to walk with God and I want them to be filled with God and I want them to know the Holy Spirit and I want them to know the Spirit because they were raised in a home where the Holy Spirit is welcome and known and loved. That's what I want for my kids what dreams are you dreaming? Growing up, we lived a quarter mile off the block. We lived on a, you had to get lost to get to the house I grew up in. You blacktop, you multiple lefts and hooks around and, and swirlies. You had to get in the woods of Cason, Texas, and you might stumble across my driveway, right? And then my driveway was a quarter mile off the blacktop that you had to get lost on to find. So you, we were out there. Every day when we would go to school, my mother would walk that driveway. And she'd pray for her kids every day, back and forth. And she'd walk that drive praying for us. I don't know that she ever prayed, God, give Stacy and Matt and Daniel a really easy life. I don't think she ever prayed that. But I know she prayed, God, make my kids know you and love you. I know that. What dreams are you dreaming for your family? I want my family to have a life of spiritual power and joy. And what we're going to look at today is the difference between a mundane spiritual life and a life that is filled with joy, power, and true satisfaction in God. That's what we're going to look at today. Ephesians 5 is where we're going to be. We're going to start in verse 15. So if you're there, let me hear you say the Bible is true. If you're a guest with us today, thank you again for being here. I want you to know you are in a church where we believe God's word is true, every single word of it. The Bible is true. Here's what the Bible says. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So Paul says, here's what he's saying. saying, pay attention to how you live, right? Live with wisdom. Walk with wisdom. Live with discernment, right? Live with spiritual awareness. Know that the days are evil. Live with discernment um, uh, and make best use of the time. Live knowing the will of God. Know what the will of the Lord. Well, how do I live like that? The answer is in verse 18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the answer. So Paul says in verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is, what's that word? Debauchery. Well, that's a fancy word, isn't it? Here's what that means. Debauchery. Recklessness, thoughtlessness, carelessness. That's what it means. It is the opposite of everything he just told us to live with. Wisdom, discernment, discipline, knowing God's will. Live, Walk that out. Do not get drunk, drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. That's the opposite of those things. So in verse 18, we see two imperatives. The first one, do not get drunk with wine. The second one, be filled with the Spirit. Those are the two imperatives that we see there. And this is, by the way, discovering what this means, which is what to, a lot of today is about, I want to say it's been a journey we've been on for several years now as a church. So I want to remind you that Paul is commanding Christians who have the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you go, I don't know, what that doesn't make sense to me. What do you mean? I mean, when we are saved, when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, 
and we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Paul has already told them that in this letter he wrote to them. He called them saints at the very beginning of the letter, affirming this is a church of believers. So then this command is not just to possess the Holy Spirit, it is to be filled with Him. We're going to talk about what that means in just a minute. And that phrase, filled with the Spirit, shows up all over the New Testament, over and over again. And listen, every time it shows up, something powerful happens. Put me to the test on that, by the way. Go through the book of Acts. Go through the history of the early church. Find every time it says he was filled with the Spirit, they were filled with the Spirit, and being filled with the Spirit. And notice, right after that, something unbelievable happens. In Acts chapter 2, they were praying in the upper room, asking God to show up. The Holy Spirit falls, tongues of fire. The church is born when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, that very same church is being persecuted for preaching the gospel. And rather than dispersing and everybody going and getting in their bunker, rather than doing that, the Bible says they prayed. And the place where they were gathered was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they went out and proclaimed boldly the works of God. Acts chapter 7, Stephen is being stoned to death. And if you read that story, what you find, you see a moment where a man knows he is being publicly murdered and he has perfect peace. And God even gives him a vision of his glory as he died. The Bible says that man was filled with the Holy Spirit. No wonder Paul commands this, right? And this command to be filled with the Spirit is going to drive everything for the rest of the letter. In the weeks ahead, we're going to be talking about our marriages. If you read verse 22, 23, 24, he starts talking about husbands, wives, kids, your job, employers, all of that's about to come up over the next few weeks. And all of the commands, everything is driven by this, to be filled with the Spirit. And when Paul writes this to the letter, listen, when he writes this letter to the church, he is talking to every single Christian in that church. I want you to just I want you to hear me this morning. You may be a new believer. The command to be filled with the Spirit is for you. You may have been saved literally all, almost all of your life. You may have spent the majority of your life as a believer. The command to be filled with the Spirit is for you. Here's why. I'm going to put this up. I want you to see it. The Spirit-filled life is not aimed at the super-Christian. The Spirit-filled life is intended to be the norm for every Christian. Are you with me? This is not for the super-Christian. This is not a pastor, elder, life group leader, deacon thing. This is for every believer to be. God's will for new beginnings is that we would be a church of believers that are filled with the Spirit. So there's three questions I want to answer this morning. I want to answer the question, what is the Spirit-filled life? What is it? Then I want to answer the question, what's the evidence of the Spirit-filled life? What's the evidence that I have that? What's the evidence that this, this church is filled with the Spirit? Third question, how do we experience it? What is it? What's the evidence of it? And how do we experience it? Answer that first question, what is the Spirit-filled life? Here it is. The Spirit-filled life is a life that is permeated with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. What is the Spirit-filled life? It is a life that is permeated with and controlled. Now, two words, permeated and controlled, really important. How did we get to those two words? We get to those two words from the language and the, the picture that Paul paints in verse 18 when he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. That word filled, the Greek of that word means thoroughly permeated. Guess what it can also mean? Intoxicated. That's what it can mean. Completely controlled by. Listen, when someone is drunk, none of you know what this experience is, obviously, (laughs) but I'm sure you've met somebody maybe at some point. When someone, is <laughs> when someone is drunk, 
There is no part of them, no part of them, that is left unaffected by, al- by the alcohol that's in them. Their emotions are affected. Their physical responses are affected. Their thinking, their mental capacities are all affected. And listen, if somehow, if somehow you could mask all of that, you could be drunk and mask the emotional, physical, mental, the, if, if somehow you could do that, they could still take a sample of your blood and see that you had been drinking literally because the alcohol is everywhere in you. Everywhere in you. It has permeated you. It is, it's so permeated your body that there's no place it doesn't show up. So when Paul wants us to understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he said in the same way that someone is drunk with wine means they're under the control of wine. In that way, be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Thoroughly permeated. Thoroughly permeated. When we're filled with the Spirit, He has so permeated our life that He is in control. Our actions, our behaviors, our words, our emotions, our thought life, under His control. And listen, when we are under His control, something really powerful begins to happen. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the nature and the life of Jesus begins to be lived through us. I think most believers live discouraged because they're trying to be like Jesus and can't figure out why they can't do it, why they struggle. You want to know why? Because we're not filled with the Spirit. I can't live like Christ without the ongoing work and filling of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly, by the way, what Jesus told us the Holy Spirit would do in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. If you want to discover What Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, start there. John 14 and 16. In John 14 and 16, Jesus tells us it's the Holy Spirit that is going to testify about him. In in those chapters, Jesus told us it's the Holy Spirit that's going to bring to our minds everything Christ taught us. In those two chapters, he says it's the Holy Spirit that's going to guide us into the truth of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to declare Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to glorify Jesus through us. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that causes the life of Jesus to come alive in us. Do you want the life of Christ to come alive in you? That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And even Jesus said, I must go so he can come and bring me to life in you in this way. So my favorite uh, food in the whole world right now, to this day, from the time I was a child, was fried catfish. Amen. Can I get a witness? Preach, preacher. Preach, preacher. Uh, I do some shady stuff for catfish. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> uh, we ate it once a week growing up in my house. Once a week, we ate it. We'd run trot lines through the season. We'd run them at night, get up early, go run them, cut, clean, freeze it. We ate it once a week all year long. Listen, when I would pull up to my house and get out of the truck or we'd get out of the car or whatever, The moment I stepped on our front porch, nobody had to tell me fish was cooked. I could smell it. It was everywhere. It was outside the house. It was in every room of the house. Nobody had to tell me. Listen, I didn't walk in and ask, are we having catfish for dinner? I walked in looking for catfish because it it had permeated everything. The aroma was everywhere. Believer, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the aroma of Christ is all over you. No one has to ask who you belong to. It's all over you. The life of Christ just shows up in how you treat people, how you talk to them, how you think what you do. All right, so what does this look like then? What does it look like for a church to be filled with people that are filled with the Holy Spirit? That's the next question. Let's ask this. What is the evidence of the Spirit-filled life? Three things. We become joyful people who worship authentically. 
live thankfully, and display humility. What is the evidence of the Spirit-filled life? We become joyful people who worship authentically, live thankfully, and display humility. Look again at Ephesians 5.18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, being filled with the Spirit, verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul gives three evidences here of the Spirit-filled. I want you to hear me say this. The Spirit-filled life is not first or even primarily seen in how loud I am about Jesus. It is primarily seen in my worship of Him, in my gratitude to Him, and in my humility lived out toward you. That's the evidence as Paul gives, right? As believers in the church pursue the filling of the Spirit, listen, it changes the atmosphere of the church. Which means being filled with the Holy Spirit is not about me and Jesus. It's about we and Jesus. It's about us and Jesus. It's why we we pursue this together. It's why we ask for it together. So Paul gives three things here. I just want to quickly unpack them that are evidences of the Spirit-filled life. The first one is authentic worship. We will worship authentically. Now, I'm, a, I'm an old worship pastor if you don't know that about me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to stay here too long. Look at verse 19. Addressing one another in psalms and... So now being filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart uh, to the Lord with your heart. I want want you to look at the word singing and making melody. I do not have time to unpack the doctrine of singing that ought to resound in the body of Christ, but I need you to hear me say, God's people are a singing people. That's as simple as I can say it. Where you cannot navigate God's word, almost any book, without his people singing or the command to sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Sing and give glory to God, right? Give praise to God. Lift your voice over and over again. And right here we come to this place and Paul says, sing, make melody to the Lord. God's people are a singing people. And I know some of you, you come in and you go, nah, pastor, it's just better for everybody if I don't sing. I'm just, uh, <laughs> just better. If you want people to join your church, I'm going to keep my mouth closed, right? <laughs> it's not better. It's not. It's not better. When we sing together, when we make melody to the Lord in our hearts, something really powerful happens. The power in our worship and the power in our song, it moves in two directions simultaneously. It moves vertically to God and horizontally to one another. That's what it does. Corporate worship is meant to be the gathering together of spirit-filled believers who sing to the Lord and to one another the story of God's love and the story of God's goodness and the power of God's glory. And as we worship Jesus, it is to Him and it is for one another. How do I know that? Because I've experienced it in my own life. I can't tell you the number of Sundays I've sat in that seat and struggle to have the desire to get up here. 
but sitting in that seat and having the canopy of your worship and your songs just layered over me fills my heart with joy, fills my heart with a longing for God. I have sat right there and experienced the blessing of you admonishing me with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I felt it. So have you. Why? Because our worship is vertical to God and horizontal to one another. And Paul says when we sing and make melody, it is in our hearts. It's to the Lord in our hearts. Which means worship is an inside-out experience. But it's an inside It's an engaging of our heart with the God that strengthens us and blesses the body. So I want to say this. You guys don't have any idea how hard I'm working to edit all my thoughts right now because I, I want to preach a sermon on worship. That's not what this is. But I do want to say this. If when you gather on a Sunday or a Wednesday and you would rather sit, arms crossed, watch the room, look at your watch, no desire to sing, no desire to engage. Listen to me, that's a problem. And it's not a problem with what's happening in the room. It's a problem with what is happening in your heart. Paul says when we are filled with the Spirit, we will sing, we will worship in a way that blesses others as we exalt Jesus. Our worship together we become like telescopes. Here's what I mean. I used to have a telescope. I'd look in it, and I remember when I finally got it dialed in, and I saw the moon went through the telescope. Now, it broke. I think, I don't know who, I'm going to blame my kids. They bro- my kids <laughs> broke it. Right. And I remember seeing it. Here's what I know to be true about that telescope. That telescope didn't make the moon. It didn't create the light of the moon. It didn't make the moon beautiful. And it, you know what it did? It brought the glory of the moon closer so I could see it and feel it. When we worship, we don't make God glorious. He is glorious. Worship is when we bring the glory and the beauty and the wonder of God closer so we can see it. Are you with me? So this is why, hear me say, This is not, worship is not a spectator sport. It is not meant to be observed. It is meant to be engaged because when we engage it, Jesus is exalted. And when he is exalted, we are built up together. Okay. We worship authentically when we're filled with the Spirit. Here's the other thing we do. We live thankfully. We have a thankful life. A thankful life. Look at verse 20. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks when? Always. Give thanks for what? Everything. Everything. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be people who see God at work in our lives and His goodness at work in our lives, and we're going to see it in everything, and it doesn't mean everything is always going good with us. doesn't mean that. But being filled with the Holy Spirit means I have eyes to see God's goodness no matter how things are going with me. It means I see the goodness of God in the most difficult moments. Right? When I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I just, I'm awestruck at God's faithfulness and His goodness toward me. And suddenly, that goodness and my gratitude for it is in my mind, in my heart, and it's on my lips. It's on my lips, right? So I want to say this. If you find yourself living with a critical spirit, if you find yourself negative, complaining, ungrateful. That's the flesh. Hear me, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we all find ourselves there at times. So when we're filled with the Spirit, authentic worship, a thankful life, here's the third one. We will display humility. We will display humility. 
Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. When the Holy Spirit has filled us, we live with a reverence to the Lord. Reverence meaning I'm humbled before the Lord and I exalt, I lift him up. I, had, I elevate him and I lower myself. It's what, it's what reverence is. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we live with a reverence to the Lord, listen, which enables us to humble ourselves and live in deference to one another. Reverence to the Lord is what will help you live with deference to those around you. Right? What does it mean to live with deference to one another? What is that? Right? All we have to do is look at the life that Jesus modeled for us to see that the Son of God laid down His rights and His will to elevate the good of His bride, the church. We're going to talk about submission in the next couple of weeks. Ladies, all you got to do is read the next couple of verses, 22, 23. You're already dreading that day, right? <laughs> but submission shows up in everything that we're going to talk about. How do we do that? Why does my flesh war against it? Because I'm not filled with the Spirit. We display humility. We live with deference to one another. Now, think about those three things. Authentic worship, genuine thankfulness and gratitude, and mutual submission and humility. I want to tell you something. All three of those are on display in this room every Wednesday night. Every time we gather to pray, all three of those are on display in here. We worship authentically. We take time to give glory to God publicly about the good thing. We, we're thankful. We acknowledge that. We say it out loud. And we, there's a tremendous amount of submission and humility in the room because even though we all have our own issues and our own problems and our own desires and wants, we set those aside to elevate the needs of others in prayer and to intercede. They're all on display in this room. And I want you to hear me say this. It is my goal as the pastor of our church that Sunday morning would look more like Wednesday night and not less. And I'm, again, inviting you. If you know you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, come and pray on Wednesday night. Listen, you may go, man, I came twice. It didn't do anything for me. If gathering with God's people to pray and call on the name of the Lord and confess your sin doesn't do anything for you, it has nothing to do with what happens on Wednesday night. That's... It's not a prayer issue, is my point. Come pray with us. Because my goal moving forward is that what we do in here would look a lot more like that. Authentic worship, genuine gratitude, mutual humility and submission to being filled with the Spirit. Okay, last thing. So how do we experience this? How do we experience the Spirit-filled life? It is the Spirit's ongoing work as we seek Him and surrender to Him. How do we experience the Spirit-filled life? It is His ongoing work. As it, it's, it's not a one-time thing. And we see that when we look again at verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit. That, wor that verb, filled, is in what is called the present passive imperative. And I apologize in advance for the English lesson that we're all going to have just real quick. It's in the present passive imperative. What do I mean? It's in the present in the sense that it's an ongoing uh, action that happens. It's ongoing. Every day, continuous moment by moment, it's ongoing. 
It's in the passive, meaning it's an action being done to us. It's not one we do on ourselves. It's one done to us. But it's imperative in the sense that it's a command. All right? So think about that. So while the Spirit fills us, that's the passive part, we receive. We have a command to be filled. That's the imperative. And it's to be an ongoing reality in our everyday life. That's the present or to say it another way, and I've said it this way before, but just a reminder, to say it this way, be being kept filled by the Spirit at all times. That's, that's what it means. Be being kept filled by the Spirit at all times. Well, what does that look like, and how do I do that? How do I do that? How do we seek the filling of the Holy Spirit? I want to give you... Three very quick things, and then I want us to pray. Here's the first one. If what we want is the filling of the Holy Spirit, we have to confess all known sins. Confess all known sins. If we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, it could be because we have grieved Him in some way. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit. It offends Him. Listen, in the same way that when someone offends you or lies about you or betrays you, it grieves you. The Holy Spirit is a person. And when we sin, it grieves Him. Which means, if what we need is to be being kept filled by the Spirit at all times, and our sin sin grieves the Holy Spirit, that means we have to keep short accounts with God. We can't just go in lingering, unconfessed sin and believe that we're filled with the Spirit. We're not. We're not. And confession of sin is to be a continual, ongoing thing. I love what D.L. Moody said. D.L. Moody, powerful pastor, theologian, was asked, Pastor Moody, are you filled with the Spirit? Here's what he said, yes, but I leak. (laughs) Man, I feel that, don't you? I feel that. Yes, I am, but I leak because I sin. And when I sin, it grieves him. And I need to confess to get a fresh feeling. So I want you to hear me say this. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, immediately confess and repent of that and receive forgiveness and submit again to the filling of the Holy Spirit. Confess all known sin. Here's the second thing. we got to obey the Spirit no matter what. We have to obey the Holy Spirit no matter what. In the same way that sin grieves him, when we don't do what he tells us to do, it quenches him. How many of you know you can point to moments in your life where you know good and well the Holy Spirit told you to say something to someone or go give someone money or be generous or do something and you didn't do it? I have those moments. You know what that did? It quenched the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Nothing attracts the Holy Spirit like humility and obedience. Confess all known sin. Obey the Holy Spirit no matter what. Some of you have text and phone calls you need to make today to restore a relationship. Today. If what you need is the filling of the Spirit, it needs to happen. Here's the third thing. You want to experience the filling of the Holy Spirit? Ask for it. Ask for it. The filling of the Spirit is the work of God and not man. This this has not come through human achievement. And Jesus wanted us to understand this in Luke 11 when he said, Ask and you will receive. Seek, come after, long for it, look for it, go after it, and you will find it. Knock and the door will be open to you. For the one who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, it's going to be opened. And he says this, Or which one of you, if your son is hungry, and he comes to you and says, Can I have some bread? You're going to give him a stone. Nobody's going to do that. 
If he says, Dad, can I have some fish? You're going to give him a serpent. Then he says this, if you then who are evil know how to take care of and give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Ask for it. Ask for it. All right, so here's the question, and then we're going we're gonna to pray, we're going to respond. What would it look like for us to do this right now? Right now. To just ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. What would that look like? Well, it would look like as a body, we confess all known sin. We obey the Holy Spirit no matter what. And we ask for it. So in just a moment, Zach and the team are going to start to sing. And some of you know you need this. And it isn't going to happen until you humble yourself before the Lord, confess sin, turn from it and ask him to fill you. But when the body of Christ gets serious about this, powerful things have begin to happen. Some of you don't know Jesus as your Lord today. You just don't. You've not made him the Lord of your life. And the prayer you need to pray is Jesus, save me, forgive me of my sin and be my Lord and Savior because I need that power that comes when your spirit comes, I need that. You know where that begins? By the forgiveness of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. It begins with. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and you need to be saved, there's going to be some people standing against the walls. Just go grab one of them. You go, man, that's embarrassing. Yeah, but eternity's forever. And eternity separated from God is forever. I'll take one awkward moment to get my eternity right. If you need Jesus, go grab somebody. I need to make Jesus Lord. For the rest of us in this room, listen. Either you stay in your seat and you call on the name of the Lord or you come to the altar with me and you humble yourselves in front of everybody. When you get up and you come down here, you know what you say to the room? I need something that I don't have and I need to go get it. I need to pray my way back to God. Come and pray. Confess sin. Ask for it. Obey the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love you. And we need you. We need to be a church that is filled with people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. So right now, I pray you would do the work that pleases you. Give us the humility and the courage to obey you.